Hello and welcome to the lecture for chapter 7. This week we're going to cover the first two years in terms of psychosocial development. What will you learn in this chapter? Does a difficult newborn become a difficult child? What do babies do to indicate how responsive their parents are? Do infants benefit or suffer when cared for by someone other than their mother? So we're covering motions. This is a quick rundown of developing motions. At birth, there's distress and contentment. At six weeks, a social smile develops. At three months, there's laughter and curiosity. At four months, there's full responsive smiles. And four to eight months, there's anger. At nine to 14 months, there's fear of social events in terms of strangers and separation from caregiver. At 12 months, there's fear of unexpected sights and sounds. And at 18 months, there's self-awareness, pride, shame, and embarrassment. All right, we'll go into more detail on all of that bit by bit. So first, we're going to cover early emotions. There is a high emotional responsiveness at this time, and there is reactive pain and pleasure to complex social awareness. Smiling and laughing occurs. As I mentioned, the social smile at six weeks is evoked by viewing human faces. Laughter develops at three to four months and is often associated with curiosity. All right, and moving on to the next is anger. This is first expressed around six months. It is a healthy response to frustration. Sadness appears in the first months. It indicates withdrawal and is accompanied by increased production of cortisol. This is a stress hormone, and it is a stressful experience for infants. All social emotions affect the brain. Abuse and unpredictable responses are especially destructive. Abuse and unpredictable responses are likely among the early adverse influences that have lasting effect on the developing neurobiological systems in the brain. Next up is fear, and it emerges at about nine months in response to people, things, and situations. There is stranger wariness. This is when it may seem as an infant no longer smiles at any friendly face, but cries or looks frightened when an unfamiliar person moves too close. There's also separation anxiety. Tears, dismay, or anger occur when a familiar caregiver leaves. If it remains strong after age three, it may be considered an emotional disorder. In the picture on the right, both Santa's smile and Olivia's grimace are appropriate reactions for people of their age. Adults playing Santa must smile no matter what, and if Olivia smiled, that would be troubling to anyone who knows about seven-month-olds. Yet every Christmas, thousands of parents wait in line put their infants on the laps of oddly dressed bearded strangers. I particularly find the look on the infant's face entertaining there. I might agree with that even at this age. All right, and moving on to toddler's emotions. It requires an awareness of other people. It emerges from family interactions and is influenced by culture. By age two, most toddlers display the entire spectrum of emotions and begin to regulate their reactions. Toddler emotions strengthen with memory and mobility advances. Anger and fear become less frequent and more focused. Laughing and crying become louder and more discriminating. Temper, temper tantrums may appear. Social awareness is influenced by context and culture. This includes pride, shame, embarrassment, disgust, guilt, empathy, and generosity. All right, and continuing on with emotional development, Self-awareness. This is part of the foundation for emotional growth. A person's realization that he or she is a distinct individual whose body, mind, and actions are separate from those or from other people. Empathy and generosity emerge apart from selfish mo motives. All 
All right, now we'll discuss mirror recognition. This is a classic experiment. Babies aged 9 to 24 months looked into a mirror after a dot of rouge had been put on their noses. None of the babies younger than 12 months old reacted as if they knew the mark was on them. However, the 15 to 24 month olds showed self-awareness by touching their noses with curiosity. They knew the rouge was on their nose. Now we're going to discuss temperament. This is a biologically based core of individual differences in approach style and environmental response. It is stable across time and situations. Temperament is not the same as personality. Temperamental traits are genetic. Personality traits are learned. Temperamental traits may lead to personality differences, though. Expressing emotions. Brain maturation is crucial for emotional development, especially in response to others. Experience, context, ethnicity, and culture connects the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Innate reactions and caregiver actions activate and prune neurons in the multiple infant brain. The brain and emotions. Experience and culture shape functional anatomy and self-representation. Emotional social impulses are directly connected to maturation of the anterior cingulate gyrus and other parts of the limbic system in the brain. And it is related to the development of preferences for specific others. Remember, all emotional responses begin in the brain. All right, now we're going to discuss temperament over time. There's a New York longitudinal study that was started in the 60s and found that infants manifest nine traits that cluster into four categories. And only three dimensions are found in future studies. The categories include easy, difficult, slow to warm up, and hard to classify. The three dimensions of temperament are apparent. Effortful control, which is able to regulate attention and emotion, to self-soothe. Negative mood, which is fearful, angry, and unhappy. And exuberant, which is active, social, or not shy. In another longitudinal study of infant temperament, they group four months old into three distinct types based on the responses to a fearful stimulation. Positive exuberant, negative, and inhibited or fe fearful. Less than half altered their responses as they grew older. Fearful infants were most likely to change. Exuberant infants were least likely to change. Maturation and child rearing has effect on the inborn temperament. Still on temperament here, and recent research also supports temperament related continuity and change in infants. Later hostility is less when mothers were loving and patient with angry infants. Increased risk for later emotional problems in difficult temperament infants related to difficult maternal pregnancy birth and depression anxiety. Difficult infants became easier with excellent parental care and more difficult with chaotic or erratic parenting. Here's a breakdown of temperament. Especially if children were fearful, it is worth noting adults who are reassuring, helpful, or reassuring and help children overcome an innate fearfulness. If children do not change, it is not known whether that's because their parents are not sufficiently reassuring, nurture, or because they are temperamentally more fearful, which would be nature. Do babies' temperaments change? Sometimes. And here in the graphs, you can see a breakdown of the information. All right, 
seems like we were headed in terms of a social connection here, and now we'll cover the development of social bonds. The word used in this situation is called synchrony, and this is a coordinated, rapid, and smooth exchange of responses between a caregiver and an infant. And synchrony in the first few months becomes more frequent and elaborate. It helps infants learn to read others' emotions and to develop the skills of social interaction, and usually begins with parents imitating infants. Well, if there is synchrony, then there is such a thing as neglected synchrony. In experiments using the still face technique, an experimental practice in which an adult keeps his or her face unmoving and expressionless to in face-to-face -face interaction with an infant. In this situation, babies become very upset by the still face and show signs of stress. The conclusions are parents' responsiveness to an infant's aids psychological and biological development, and infants' brains need social interaction to develop to their fullest. Furthering the development of social bonds, we will discuss attachment. This involves lasting, a lasting emotional bond that one person has with another. It begins in, to form an early infancy and influences a person's close relationships throughout life. It overtakes synchrony and is demonstrated through proximity seeking and contact maintaining. All right, now we're going to discuss stages of attachment from birth to six weeks. Pre-attachment. Newborns signal via crying and body movements that they need others. When people respond positively, the newborn is comforted and learns to seek more interaction. Newborns are also primed by brain patterns to recognize familiar voices and faces. At six weeks to eight months, Attachment in the making. Infants respond preferentially to familiar people by smiling, laughing, and babbling. Their caregiver's voices, touch, expressions, and gestures are comforting, often overriding the infant's impulse to cry. Trust develops. At eight months to two years, this is called classic secure attachment. Infants greet the primary caregiver, play happily when he or she is present, Show separation anxiety when the care and show separation anxiety when the caregiver leaves. Both infant and caregiver seek to be close to one another, which is proximity, and frequently look at each other, which is contact. In many caregiver infant pairs, physical touch, patting, holding, and caressing is frequent. At two to six years, attachment as launching pad. Young children seek their caregiver's praise and reassurance as their social world expands. Interactive conversation with game and games, hide and seek, object play, reading, and pretending are common. Children expect caregivers to comfort and entertain. At 6 to 12 years, cultural attachment. Children seek to make their caregivers proud by learning whatever adults want them to learn, and adults reciprocate. In concrete operational thought, in terms of Piaget, specific accomplishments are valued by adults and children. Children develop loyalty to family, community, and nation. At 12 to 18 months, new attachment figures. Here's 12 to 18 years. Teenagers explore and make friendships independent from parents using their working models of earlier attachments as a base. With formal operational thinking, again with Piaget, shared ideals and goals become influential. And at 18 years on, attachment reinvented. Adults develop relationships with others, especially relationships with romantic partners and their own children, influenced by earlier attachment patterns. Past insecure attachments from childhood can be repaired rather than repeated, although this does not always happen. All right, there are attachment types, and those are secure attachment, insecure avoidant, 
insecure resistant or ambivalent and disorganized. In a secure attachment, a relationship is called type B in which infant obtains both comfort and confidence from the presence of his or her, her caregiver. In an insecure avoidant, this is a pattern of attachment type A in which infant avoids connection with the caregiver as when the infant seems not to care about the caregiver's presence, departure, or return. Insecure resistant or ambivalent, it's a pattern of attachment type C in which anxiety and uncertainty are evident as when the infant becomes very upset at separation from the caregiver and both resists and seeks contact or reunion. And lastly, disorganized, a type of attachment type D that is marked by an infant's inconsistent reactions to the caregiver's de departure and return. Insecure attachment and social setting. Harsh contexts, especially the stresses of poverty, reduce the incidence of secure attachment. Insecure attachment correlates with many later problems. Insecure attachment may be a sign, but may not be the direct cause of those problems. Attachment behaviors in the strange situation constitute only one indication of the quality of the parent-child relationship. And again, correlation is not causation. All right, here's those four types again, A, B, C, D. The insecure avoidant, secure, insecure resistant or ambivalent, disorganized. Shows how the child typically leaves and uh, is active in each of these situations. We can look at the scale here. All right, attachment parenting. The approach it prioritizes mother infant relationship during the first three years of life. Criticism include maternal guilt if not around 24-7 and less appreciation of all parents. Measuring attachment. Just mentioned the strange situation. This is a laboratory procedure for measuring attachment by evoking infants' reactions to the stress of various adults coming and going in an unfamiliar playroom. There are key observed behaviors, exploration of the toys, a secure toddler plays happily, reaction to the caregiver's departure, a secure toddler misses the caregiver, and a reaction to the caregiver's return, a secure toddler welcomes the caregiver's reappearance. All right, and on with developing a social bonds, insights from Romania. In the early 1990s, thousands of children were adopted from Romanian or orphanages. Many of these children displayed adverse outcomes. Research on them confirms that early experiences, not genetics, is their main problem. For those adopted before six months, most developed normally. For those that were adopted after age one, there were early signs that were encouraging, but long-term Cognitive and emotional deficits manifested in many. As adults, most have emotional and or conduct problems. Next up, social referencing. With increased mobility and maturation, toddlers use social referencing to detect what is safe, unsafe, and exciting in their environment. They are seeking emotional responses or information from other people. In other words, they are observing someone else's expressions and reactions and using the other person as a social reference. Referencing is used in consistent and selective ways. Fathers as social partners. Synchrony, attachment, social referencing are sometimes more apparent with fathers than mothers. Contemporary U.S. fathers of all ethnic groups are more involved with their children than their fathers were. Fathers are more listening, more smiles, playing more exciting games, and mothers spend more time caregiving, comforting, and smiling. The 
theories of infant psychosocial development. And we'll cover each of these. The infant's earliest years are influenced by significant adults in their lives. And in terms of psychoanalytic theory, Freud thought that the mother, mother influences the infant's oral and anal pleasure, whereas Erickson focused on trust and autonomy, autonomy fostered in early childhood, which affect lifelong development. Next up is behaviorism. Child behavior is molded with parental reinforcement or punishment. Child behavior also reflects social learning. And proximal parenting and distal parenting are especially influenced by culture. Next up is cognitive theory. Infants develop working models that can be interpreted and reinterpreted, and also evolutionary theory. Caregivers and infants possess innate impulses and emotions that contribute to survival and development in terms of attachment. Costs of child rearing. Parenting involves substantial physical and emotional costs. All care is essential for human survival. Same situation, far apart. Safekeeping. Historically, grandmothers were sometimes crucial for child development. Is this still important for contemporary families? How involved are grandparents anymore? Sociocultural theory. Cultural variations impact every aspect of infant care including infant daycare. Worldwide, mothers provide most newborn care with social cultural differences in allocare. In the United States, for infants under one year, 58% of their mothers were in the labor force. Variations in ideas about infant daycare are largely due to cultural background. Infant daycare and attachment. Attachment to someone is beneficial. Frequent changes and instability is problematic, though. Infants benefit from a strong relationship with parents. Infant daycare settings vary worldwide and are affected by culture, economics, and politics. All right. Research in terms of recent, past, and present. Well, certain scientists raise questions about long-term consequences of infant daycare. Canadian research reported differential daycare effects based on gender, income, and caregiver. U.S. research found differential results in centered care based on family income and mother sensitivity and program quality. Pros include cognitive advances, especially in terms of language. Cons, however, include social con Consequences are less clear, but seem connected to mother-child relationship. High-quality daycare. High-quality daycare during infancy has five essential characteristics. There is adequate attention to the infant. There is encouragement of language and sensory motor development. There is attention to health and safety. There are professional caregivers, and those caregivers are warm and responsive. Conclusions include individualized care with stable caregivers seem to be the best. Every infant needs personal responsiveness, and relationships are cru crucial. And that includes the infant and caregiver, and the caregiver and the parents. And that concludes lecture for chapter, what are we on, 7.